When I was about three years old, we found out that I had asthma. We, had, uh, we found out that I had asthma. So uh, here's how we found out. Uh, I was running around the church like a little crazy guy. And three years old, I had a lot of energy. And, uh, and my parents were so thankful when one Sunday I was finally, I was just sitting still. We're just sitting there relaxing. They're like, my goodness, maybe, maybe all those things we've been telling him about, you know, taking it easy. Maybe that's all getting through. And uh, he's sitting still. But uh, somebody came up and they said, no, I don't think he's relaxing. I think he's having an asthma attack. Look at what's happening with his neck. He can't breathe. And sure enough, they took me to the hospital and I was having asthma. So what I found out was that uh, there are a few food triggers, mostly dairy, uh, tomatoes, and corn that I could not eat. And if I ate those, I would have kind of an asthmatic response. So I remember going to the hospital being in kind of this like small tent, kind of like a camping tent, but it was filled with lots of extra oxygen so I could breathe. At one point, my lips turned blue because my body wasn't getting enough oxygen. But one thing that I learned was, hey, my body has this problem. It's not healthy. What are the things I need to do to get healthier? So started avoiding those foods, started taking uh, some uh, allergy medication that helped out with that. I had my inhaler and my nebulizer, if you guys have uh, been familiar with those things, and I found a way to get myself more healthy, thanks to the help of the medical professionals and my kind and attentive parents. And the reason I tell you that is because for many of us, not only in our physical life, <clears throat> I didn't have any pizza, I promise. Not only in our physical life, but in our spiritual life, sometimes we come to the place where we recognize, I'm not healthy. I've got issues. Sometimes we find ourselves in a place where we're like, okay, there's things going on in my heart and in my mind spiritually, and I recognize I need some help to get to a place of health. Maybe it's in uh, conversations with other people. You get stressed. We get the stress and, okay, our fuse gets a little shorter and our temper starts to fly a little bit. And we recognize, okay, I seem to have a little bit of what we could call some spiritual inflammation, right? Some conflict with other people. Or it could be that uh, within your own life, the problem that's showing up for you is that you're drifting away from God. Maybe you don't feel like you're taking in the spiritual nourishment that you need. And so you're in a place where you've got, you could say, some spiritual asthma. Not getting that spiritual oxygen of our relationship with God. Maybe uh, not working well with other believers that, uh, that you feel like you're a little bit different from. Maybe you've got what we could call a spiritual autoimmune disease where you've got part of the body of Christ is fighting against one another when it should be unified. Or maybe, in a spiritual sense, you're in a place where you feel like you've stopped growing, where you've got this, in a sense, spiritual failure to thrive, not becoming stronger and taller and more able from a spiritual sense We've got some of these issues. And today, we're going to come to a passage where the Apostle Paul is laying out what I'm going to call three spiritual vital signs. When you go to the doctor, they say, all right, we're going to put this little thing on your finger and we're going to see what your blood oxygen level looks like. Hey, we're going to check out your uh, blood pressure, check out your pulse and your temperature, see what's going on. And the Apostle Paul, in a similar way, has some spiritual vital signs that he wants to check to see if the body of Christ is healthy. One of the things we're going to see, and I've titled my message with these words, the Christian walk needs the church body. If we're going to walk as Jesus walked, walk with him and grow in our spiritual journey, we need the body of Christ just as physically in order for us to walk, we need our body to be working together. The Christian walk needs the church body. Let me pray for us and ask for God to be at work in our time together. <clears throat> Father, I thank you so much for this gathering of your people, this gathering of your body. Lord, we've come together to worship, to obey, to grow. And Lord, I pray that today you would help us to understand what spiritual maturity looks like. Not only from a physical standpoint of maturity, but Lord, from a spiritual standpoint of maturity. 
God, I pray that you would speak to us through these words. Help us to grasp this incredible opportunity to be a part of the body of Christ. Please speak to us today. Allow us to grow. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. So, like I said, the Christian walk needs the church body. There are three different uh, spiritual vital signs we're going to see within our passage. And the first one is this. The first thing that a healthy body needs is unity. A healthy church body needs unity. This last week I watched with my kids uh, a great movie. It's a football movie. It's called Woodlawn. Has anyone here ever seen the movie Woodlawn? I think it came out maybe about five years ago, something like that. It's an amazing movie, and it's set... Uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, right at about 1973. And if you know what was happening in Birmingham, Alabama at that time, that was in many ways the epicenter of the segregation that was still going on within America. I was shocked to learn that the governor of Alabama, one of the things that he proclaimed was segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. I couldn't believe that things like that had happened so recently. But what had happened was there, uh, some of the schools started to desegregate. That means that uh, the whites and the African Americans came together and were a part of the same school, the same high school, the same classes, and the same football team, just as it is that God would have it, that we would all be able to be uh, come together as uh, equals, serving and, and working alongside one another. But as this football team came together, as the story goes in this movie, uh, the coach tried to rally this team around a common anger. He said, we all need to rally our anger, and that's going to be the thing that's going to unify us and allow us to be successful as a football team. But wouldn't you know, rallying around anger in that situation was not effective. So this coach was trying to figure out, how do we bring unity within this Football, not just for the sake of the football team, but for each of these individuals as their understanding of humanity, God's creation, that all men are created equal. So he allowed kind of a traveling uh, football chaplain to come and to share about Jesus. And one of the incredible moments in this movie is the moment when uh, it's the character Sean Astin. He comes and he starts to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And they share the gospel and he gives an invitation. And almost every single one of the young men on that team give their lives to the Lord. And they're changed. And now at this point they have the ability to be united on their team around who Jesus Christ is. The fact that they have hope and unity in that. It's a great movie. I encourage you to do that, uh, to watch that movie. It's a powerful story of the unity that we find, not when we rally around a common anger or something like that, but when we come together finding unity in the body of Christ, made up of Christians from every ethnicity, language, and culture. The reality is a football team needs unity, our physical bodies need unity, and the church body needs unity as well. That's what we're going to see in our passage today. I want to encourage you, if you've got your copy of God's Word, go ahead and open with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. As we've been working through the book of Ephesians, there are six chapters, so we've just passed the halfway point. And the first three chapters were all about the theological understanding of who am I? Now that I'm a Christian, who am I in Christ? And uh, this was something that Paul needed to communicate to his audience. He wrote this letter to uh, this multicultural church. There were uh, Jews and there were Gentiles, people who had grown up within Judaism and people who had grown up worshiping other gods. But they had all come together. They'd placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Now they were a part of dozens of house churches all around Ephesus. And Paul is saying, here's who you are now And now as we turn the page into chapter 4, we're going to see here's what it looks like to live this out. Here's how you can do that. And Paul says the first stop that we're going to make is to understand how you can be unified as a body of Christ. So take a look with me, Ephesians 
chapter 4, verse 1. And here's what he says. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You know, I think this is amazing because Paul's there as a prisoner within his own home, which one commentator uh, made an educated guess. He probably was maybe on like a a third-story apartment, which is where he was renting or uh, staying. He was chained to a Roman soldier to make sure he wasn't able to escape because he was uh, kind of a prisoner of the Roman Empire. But Paul recognizes that, you know what, it's not the Roman Empire that has me here as a prisoner. No, I'm here because God is up to something. Can you think about this? This is amazing. Paul, one of the greatest missionaries of all time who had gone and been shipwrecked and seen miracles and uh, done things that uh, we uh, recount uh, throughout Acts, he had gone out and done so much, and now he's sitting there wondering, God, why do you have me here? Is this the place really that you want me to be? Isn't there somewhere? Sometimes we ask that same question, God, what are you doing in my life? What situation have you brought me into? Why me, God? But Paul was confident in his understanding that he was not a prisoner of Rome. He was a prisoner for the Lord. And through these letters, he's literally here writing Scripture by the, as he's carried along by the Holy Spirit, he, is urges, he urges us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. He says, I want you to live this out. And he starts to outline what some of these relationships look like. There's a few things he mentions. And I want you to ask yourself, is this what my relationships with others looks like? Is this what my conversation patterns look like? He's, he calls them and invites them to live with all, quote, verse 2, humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. You ever heard somebody say that? Somebody says, all right, just bear with me for a minute. And you're like, oh boy, what am I in for now? Something's about to be uncomfortable. Maybe it's going to be an uncomfortable pause. Maybe it's going to be something we don't really want to hear, but somebody says, bear with me for a minute. And the reality is that Within our Christian relationships, sometimes we have to bear with our brother or sister. Sometimes there are things that are like a little bit uncomfortable, but we say, you know what? No, I'm going to live out humility, gentleness, and patience, and I am going to bear with one another in love. Not rolling my eyes at the situation, but I'm going to be eager. What does he say in the next verse? Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. All right, so we're using this analogy of a human body showing us what it's like to be a part of the church body. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but there is kind of a, uh, there's a movie genre that's dedicated to what it looks like when a physical body is not unified. And that is the horror genre, right? Okay, if you ever watch a horror movie, which I don't watch a whole lot of, uh, if any, Uh, you might find that like the body's over there and there's an arm over here and you're like ah that is disgusting Uh, there's that's gross I don't want to see blood I don't want to see anything dismembered Uh, that makes me feel like I'm gonna throw up and the reality is that is the understanding we should have of our physical bodies it's also the understanding we should have of our spiritual body we should have that same reaction when we see disunity within the church like That's not the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be unified, working together for the glory of God. And then Paul launches into something which is really cool. He starts talking about what we are focused around. And uh, within the early church, there were things called confessions or creeds. Have you ever heard something like, I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and of earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. Uh, And talks about the Holy Spirit, goes on to talk about the church. Well, Paul starts to maybe quote a little snippets of that, and he's about to explain to us what it means that we can be unified. He says this in verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called 
to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. What is this saying? Well, the people who were there in Ephesus, some of them who were Gentiles, were raised to believe that they needed to worship lots of different spirits, that they needed to go and try to get on these, the good side of some of these spirits so that they would have uh, the spirit who's in charge of these things, that, that he's smiling down upon me. I, I need to make sure that I go to the, the temple of Artemis or Diana. I want to go and make sure that that spirit is, is going to be giving me favor. But what does he say here? There is one body and one spirit. He says, God, there's one God, and he's over all, he's through all, he's in all. I was talking about that with my daughter on the way to church. She said, okay, Dad, uh, God's everywhere. Does that mean he's sitting on top of me? Am I sitting on his lap? How does that work? I said, well, God is everywhere. He is omnipresent because every single thing that exists only exists because God is is holding it together. And that was a really good uh, conversation we had this morning. And that's what we need to recognize. We come together as a church, not with a superficial sense of unity, but with the most genuine uh, reality of unity possible. Because we have come around Christ, and He is the thing that we all have in common. So the question I want to have for you, the question I want to ask you, is how unified are you with the church body? How unified are you with other Christians? So let's just do a, uh, we don't say it out loud, but we'll do a little quiz. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being, I can't stand these other crazy Christians, okay? To 10 being, all right, anything that's mine is yours. Come on into my kitchen and eat out of my refrigerator anytime. Okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, where are you? in terms of having genuine unity with the body of Christ? Do your patterns of speech match with Paul's template that he gives us? That we would be having humility. That we would be having gentleness. That we would ex be experiencing patience and bearing with one another in love. How far are you willing to go to maintain the bond of unity and avoid those spiritual horror stories, right? The horror like uh, being disunified. You know, in my own life, one thing that the Lord has been showing me recently is that uh, sometimes I'll have the tendency to interrupt people. In my conversations, be jumping in. I'm looking for that moment I'm going to jump in and it's my turn to start talking. And I've, I've noticed and caught myself a few times interrupting somebody. I'm like, you know what? That's not a unifying approach. This is not being uh, patient or bearing with one another. No, what does it mean to listen and say, hey, we're going to come together. We're going to listen. I'm ready to experience unity with you around Jesus Christ. I'm not sure what it looks like for you to take a step of unity. Maybe it's taking somebody out, a, a brother or sister, and taking them out for lunch and say, hey, I want to hear the story of what God has done in your life. And listen, don't interrupt. Maybe it means gently showing somebody what sound doctrine looks like. There are times, and these are difficult conversations, but there are times where it comes that we need to talk with a brother and sister and say, hey, I heard you say something in small group, and I just wanted to follow up uh, to make sure I understood you right, and I got some verses I want to show you of what the Bible tells us about this particular aspect of doctrine. Those conversations sometimes can be difficult, but we need to immerse ourselves and genuine Christian community so that we can have those times where we're close enough with someone that they can come and correct us in a loving way. There's an African proverb that I love, and it says this, if you want to go fast, go alone. And uh, sometimes fast is the very exciting, cool thing, right? Fast car, we're going to do things very fast. I'm going to set a goal, and I'm going to reach that goal really fast. If you want to go fast go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Go together. And really, that's what the Apostle Paul is telling us today. If you want to go far in your journey with the Lord, you need to do it together with brothers and sisters in Christ. A healthy body needs unity. But there's another thing. 
another beautiful reality within a healthy body, and that's this, a healthy body thrives in diversity. A healthy body thrives not only when it's able to experience unity around one common uh, Savior and faith, but also when we're able to experience diversity, lots of different strengths and individuals from different backgrounds, strengths, gifting, passions, experiences. I've got a book, actually, that I want to share with you, and it's this book right here called Meg is Not Alone. I got this for uh, my kids, one of my kids, for Christmas, and I read this uh, for Calvin, my four-and-a-half-year-old, uh, maybe three weeks ago, and we've been reading it every night since. All right, Cal, what book tonight? Meg is Not Alone. Let's read it again. I'm like, all right, that's great. There's some great things in here. It's actually a true story uh, that happened to the author. And what happened, basically, she was looking for her coat, and her parents walked out the door. They left church without her. Meg could hear her mom say, hey, you got Meg? You bringing her home? She heard her dad say, hey, are you bringing Meg home? And the mom went out and went home in the car, and the dad, because it was nice weather, walked home. And there was Meg. This next picture shows her feeling all alone. She's at church. I'm not sure if I ever got left home, at, left at uh, church. I don't know. But she's over there, and she starts to cry. Because she's wondering, like, wow, I'm alone. My parents left me. I'm all by myself. And that is until her Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Hughes, shows up and she starts to talk with her and say, hey, it's going to be all right. We'll get a hold of your parents and we'll make sure that everything will come through okay. They, they talk a little bit, but Mrs. Hughes, she forgot her phone uh, in the car. And so here comes the guy who plays the piano every Sunday uh, in his wheelchair. He comes up and says, hey, I'll call your mom. So he calls the mom and, and they're there together and they say, hey, here's what happened. Puts her on the phone and she says, okay, I'll, I'll see you soon, mom. Not too long after that, as she'd been crying a little bit, a teenager comes in. Teenager comes in with some Kleenex and says, hey, uh, this is for you. Why don't you go ahead and wipe away your tears? It's going to be all right, little one. After that, a woman comes in uh, with a bag of cookies. Uh, she says, those are from the pastor's office, but, quote, he won't mind. So that's good, right? Taking the, pa the pastor's cookies. He doesn't need them, actually. And a water bottle, that's great. Another guy came and brings for her some books for her to read uh, while she waits there for her mom. And as her dad uh, comes back and, and makes his way, she starts to recount how Mrs. Hughes first helped her to not feel alone. She recounted how the man shared his phone. The teenager brought tissues, the woman brought a snack, and all the people had come together to make sure she was okay. And every time that I read that for Calvin, I'm like, this is great for him to recognize that as we come to church, each one of us, we look around and there are a diversity of individuals here. Different people with different strengths, different people of different age brackets, different people from different countries and different people in terms of spiritual maturity. Those who have just come to know the Lord and those who have been walking with Jesus for 50 years. And the reality is, a healthy body thrives in diversity. And that's what the Apostle Paul tells us. Take a look with me at verse 7. Verse 7 says this, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Grace has been given. God has bestowed his favor on each one of us to give each one of us a spiritual giftedness so that we're able to serve him, so that we're able to serve the body. What an incredible thing that is. And then Paul quotes from Psalm 68. And here's what's going on in Psalm 68. Uh, this is a passage about, uh, about a conquering military leader. And he's conquered his opponents. He's coming back to Jerusalem, probably ascending this hill, kind of geographically going uphill. And he's coming back with his, uh, the captives that have been captured. And as he gets there, uh, people start to give this leader gifts. That's what's going on in Psalm chapter 68. But it appears that the Apostle Paul either uses this as, uh, as an illustration by tweaking it just a little bit, or that he's quoting a translation that was familiar to his audience. 
because the way that he explains it, verse 8, he says, Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Instead of God being the one who's receiving gifts from us, God is the one who is giving out gifts to his people, showing that he's given us these spiritual gifts so that we can bless others. The passage continues, talks about how he ascended. After he descended, he had descended. When Jesus was on the cross, he talked with the thief on the side of him, and he said, surely today you will be with me in paradise. And our understanding is that that was a place uh, within Hades, with a place where uh, all those who had passed away, on one side there was a place of punishment, and on the other side there was a place called paradise, or Abraham's bosom. And Jesus was saying, I'm going there today and will be there. And in a sense, Jesus demonstrated his power and uh, his conquering nature over all the evil spiritual forces in the heavenly places. So he's conquered all of those uh, spirits, even the demons that came and had deceived some of the Gentiles in former times, pretending to be gods. And so now Jesus is a, a power over all of those things. And then verse 7 explains a little bit of what he has given. Some of the diversity of these roles in verse 11 says this. It says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. That's really cool. The apostles are those that there in the early church were foundational to the growth of the church, connecting them with uh, others around. The prophets are those who uh, preached the word of God and shared the truth that God had both from his word in that day. Talks about the evangelists, those people who just have this passion welling up within them supernaturally to go and share the good news with neighbors and families and, and also to rally the other believers to go and to share the good news with others. And also shepherds and teachers, these seem pretty closely related, those who are shepherding the flock and teaching them, uh, probably typically talking about those who find themselves in a pastoral role that they've been called to. So the question I've got for you, are you experiencing the blessing of being a part of a diverse church? Are you experiencing the blessing of being a part of a church with people with all different kinds of strengths, all different kinds of giftings, all different kinds of passions, all different kinds of testimonies or experiences, all different kinds of maturity levels coming together to be a healthy, growing body together for the glory of God. Personally, I'm so thankful to be a part of a generationally diverse church, a church where we've got kids downstairs learning about Jesus right now, some for the first time. To be a part of a church where there are seasoned believers who have been walking with the Lord for a long time. Be able to have everything in between as well. I'm thankful to be a part of an ethnically diverse church. Where we've got people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. People coming together to be able to share from unique vantage points how the gospel has uniquely impacted them within the, their own culture that they have been a part of. And be able to see how those things as they come together shows us parts of who God is that we never would have been able to understand if we had only been exposed to our own culture. I'm also thankful uh, for, uh, for a part of our membership commitments. We heard a little earlier about uh, coming together as a member within the church. One of the things we commit to as members of this church is this, quote, to accept and fellowship with all members regardless of race, gender, background, social status, or level of education since all are of equal value in Christ. And another commitment is this, I desire to pursue peace with all people and especially with other believers, striving to be slow to take offense and eager to reconcile. You know, when I first started attending this church in 2008, uh, I came in, I wasn't sure which door, we didn't have any signage up at that point about which door to use, so I came in this side door over here, and I came in, and anyone here remember Chuck Gillette? Chuck Gillette from back in the day, and I came in the door, and he said, well, that's one way to get in the building, and I'm like, oh, did I use the wrong door? My bad, I'm sorry. He started calling me Shorty 
because uh, he was this tall and I was this tall, so he figured he'd call me shorty, I guess. But uh, it was a great time. I figured out which, which was the right door to be using. And uh, one of the things I started to look for within the church was this. I said, I need to find an older guy who has been around the block spiritually. Somebody who uh, has had kids, has been married, who uh, maybe has been in a form of pastoral ministry, somebody I can connect with that can show me what it looks like to, to reach out to my community, somebody like me that I can learn from. And you know what I found? I found something way better. I found a beautiful family of God, men and women, that I was able to learn from and be mentored by. It was not just a one-stop shop. Because within the body of Christ, God allows this uh, diverse body of people from all different backgrounds, experiences, all coming around the one cross of Jesus Christ. I was able to be mentored, not just by one person, but by one cohesive body, serving the Lord together. That was very encouraging for me to recognize that that's what God, that's the design he has for each one of us. You know, um, our bodies are designed to work together. And uh, sometimes we try to dance. Now, I'm not going to dance for you right now because I might end up on TikTok or something, and that probably would not be good because I'm not the greatest dancer. Uh, in fact, uh, one time uh, I went to a Lecrae concert. I don't know if you've ever heard of Lecrae. went to a Lecrae concert. I had a shirt on, and somebody said, hey, do uh, you like Lecrae? You want to meet him? I was like, yeah, sounds great. So they brought me backstage with some other people, and, and then he came out and got to meet him and talk with him a little bit, and then they said, oh, are you guys, uh, when Lecrae's final song goes on during his set, we want you to come up on stage and just dance like crazy. And I'm like, all right, I can do that. That's great. So got to go up on stage with him, and in my best white man dancing, I, uh, I gave him my best shot, and I was up there, and uh, I didn't do so good. But you could say I had two left feet, okay? Two left feet when you're dancing. It's not a good thing, right? You're like, oh, that guy's trying to dance, but he's got two left feet. Well, here's the thing. Within the body of Christ, we need a left foot and a right foot. We need a left hand and a right hand. We need arms and legs, and uh, you can do the hokey pokey, right? And turn yourself around. But the reality is we need all different parts of the body to come together, and that's why it's such a joy when we see a diversity within some of these roles that God has blessed us with. So we need a church that is marked by unity. We need a church that is marked by a diversity. And then we can just sit back and relax and drink lemonade until Jesus comes back. That's actually not what Paul says in this passage. Paul says as you come together in unity and diversity, it's time to get to work. The reality is a healthy body matures and ministers. A healthy body is one that grows up, matures, and starts to minister to other people. A few days ago, Calvin came into my room. I woke up and came in, and he asked me, Dad, how do they make lamps? And I was like, that's a great question, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure. So we pulled it up on YouTube, right? Like, let's see, how do they make lamps? So we watched a little video with the factory, and I'm like, oh, this is really cool. I didn't know that. So then there was another video, how do they make TVs? And I'm like, well, I don't really know that either. Let's watch How Do They Make TVs. And then I think the next one we watched was How Do They Make a Tesla. So they came in and the raw materials came through and they stamped it and they put it all together and out comes a nice shiny Tesla. I'm like, okay, that's pretty cool. And then Cowan asked me a great question. Dad, how does God make people? And I was like, that's a great question, Calvin. Let's check YouTube, all right? And uh, what we actually did, I had, seen a, I had seen a video clip created by a Christian organization about what it looks like inside a womb when a little baby going from just a few cells continues to develop and mature and grow into uh, a baby, uh, of course. And so we watched that, and we were part of the way through, and they're like, well, that kind of looks really weird. I'm like, well, that's what you used to look like, actually, right? And so the baby continues to grow. It's always kind of shocking, like, wow, how early that heart starts to beat, and how early the, the fingers and the toes show up, and it's so cool to see. And we started to talk about how it's so important for each one of us to continue to grow up, to mature. We don't want any person, their body, to stop growing and maturing. Uh, that's, uh, that's not a healthy thing. A healthy body grows and matures. And the, the same is true for us 
spiritually. Paul doesn't want us to remain spiritual infants, but instead to grow up to be spiritually mature men and women. Here's how he explains it in Ephesians 4, verse 12. Here's what he says. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's the role of, uh, I just said it a few minutes ago, the, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and shepherds and teachers. He gave them, why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. In our small group this last week over at the Joneses, uh, we had the opportunity, we went around and everybody shared one of the places or a few other places that they're serving within the church. So some people said, hey, I've served in the nursery. Uh, I've served as a greeter. Uh, I've had an opportunity to serve on the worship team, to, uh, to serve in lots of those different ways. And it came to me and somebody said, well, what do you do? And I said, well... I do whatever I can, you know, whatever I can. And one guy said, oh, that's a cop-out. Come on. I'm like, I don't know. I'm just uh, doing what I can. But as I come to this verse, I'm like, you know what? That's what I should have said. Because Paul says the role of a, a leader within the church is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. To equip the saints. There are some churches that say, okay, we'll show up on Sunday and we're going to pay the pastor to do everything, all right? He can do everything that needs to be done. Well, anybody, anything needs to get done, we'll pay a staff person to do it. But that's not God's design for the church. God's design is that the church leaders would be investing in all the saints, every brother and sister who has been saved, to equip them to do the work of ministry. So that is, next time, if I could ask that question, I'm seeking to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry until we all grow up and become mature. Now, he, he talks about the danger of not becoming spiritually mature. He says in verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. And we're like, okay, what exactly does that mean? Well, one of the words here is the word for like dice, uh, kind of like uh, gambling, or the idea that you could go and you could be uh, deceived by someone who's trying to take advantage of you. That's actually what Paul is saying, I don't want this to happen to you. I don't want anything bad to happen to you. I don't want you to be tossed to and fro in the waves. Now, I don't do a whole lot of like uh, sailing or I don't hang out on boats that often, but uh, I was trying to think what's a, what's a modern day equivalent, something that we would all be familiar with. And one of the things I thought about was, I think what Paul's trying to say is something like, I don't want you to be a kid out in the middle of traffic flopping around, getting hit by cars because of the danger that's there. You know, when I first had kids, when Emily and I first had kids, traffic to me became something completely different than I had ever understood before because I all of a sudden recognized the danger of walking into traffic. We got to keep our kids safe. We got to make sure that they're not going to be in a place that they would be taken advantage of or, or injured in any way. And Paul says, I don't want you to be injured by bad doctrine. It is that serious. He says, rather, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Did you guys see that one coming? We've been talking about this body, but you know what? Paul tells us Jesus is the head. Jesus is the one running the show. He's the one telling the arms and the feet what we should be doing, how we should be caring for one another. And that's our call, to listen to the head of the church, Christ. He is the head of the body of Christ. It says that we're joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So my question for you is this. Are you growing spiritually? Are you growing spiritually? Where you have yourself right now is a great place to do that. Lift up your hands and worship. Find yourself in conversation with other believers who can encourage you and to receive the word of God and seek to apply that within your life. Lots of great ways to be growing spiritually, but one thing that's intertwined with growing in spiritual maturity 
is ministering to others. Being able to serve as we grow older, as we, uh, as we have kids and things like that from a, a physical sense, we realize, I got some other people I got to take care of. I got some needs. I got I to gotta microwave their chicken nuggets. I got to make sure their water bottles filled with water, their, their uh, lunch is packed. I got to make sure that they're in a safe home. And then the same way, we're called as believers to minister to others in our lives. And I didn't really think about it like this before. But what I realized was if we're not in a place where we're ministering to somebody else, someone is minis- missing out on what God has gifted you with. God has gifted each one of us who are believers with spiritual gifts that we can bless others with. And so if we're not in a place where we're serving, there's lots of different places to serve, whether it's in your home, in your workplace, here in the church, out in the world, lots of different ways to serve. But if we're not serving, somebody is missing out on the way that God has uniquely gifted to you. So I want to share with you actually the final couple pages of this book, Meg is Not Alone. Because as Meg looked around, she started to realize, okay, there are these people at my church who love me. And so her dad says this. He said, I'm sorry you were left alone, but I'm thankful you weren't alone for long. God took care of you. God, Meg asked. She was confused. She had been thinking about her new church friends. Yes, her dad said, God gave us church friends to take care of us. When we are alone or scared or need help, the people at church are our friends. They love us because they love God. And God shows his love for us by sending them to help. I'm a church friend too, Meg said. I made baby Robert smile when he was sad. And Meg looked back. I'm glad I have church friends, she said. And then Meg and her dad walked home. The end. And the reality is that as the church ministers to others, as we mature together, it's God at work. It's God caring for us in that way. We need to be unified. We need to be a church with a diversity of giftedness and passions. And we need to be a church that matures and ministers to others. Because if we're going to do this Christian walk, we're going to need the church body.